matter where we live, in the city or the country, we must be ready all the time to do the right thing. Yes, we must all get ready now. Hello, and welcome to part two in my SHD Cyberdeck build series. Uh, in the first video of the series, I talked about uh, kind of the purpose and the idea behind this build, that it was inspired by the division, gave a feature tour, talked about how it is useful and usable in a kind of field scenario in a post-apocalyptic environment, let's say. And uh, that's pretty interesting, I think, in and of itself, but I want my videos to be more than just interesting. I want them to be useful and usable by you, the viewing audience, to understand how all this went together and how you can maybe build your own. And that's what all the rest of the videos in this series are going to be, starting with this one, where we're going to talk about the components that are contained within. And in order to talk about those, we're going to have to disassemble this. Thankfully, the first step in that is pretty easy. It's just to take this front panel off, which is fairly easy to do with a simple screwdriver. So let's get started. All right, so as I'm taking this out, I'm using a screwdriver much like you would do to open up the can of paint. Um, I will note that these little bolts in the corners are purely cosmetic because it is friction fit. Uh, they aren't really necessary, they just kind of make it look neat. So I'm going to use this piece of foam in order to protect the screen as I set it down on its face. And I need to unplug it from the keyboard, that USB-C cable. But there you go. That is... That is the guts of this thing. And I'll turn it around so you can see the wiring and the cabling. And now as we get ready to kind of disassemble and talk through all the component pieces, uh, I will note uh, all of these are metric five bolts. And so I have a nice little metric Allen wrench here that I will use to take things apart. And we'll just talk through the components as we go. So the first component is just this battery right here. And it's just uh, set in with Velcro holding into the battery tray. Uh, you can see that as it is cabled, uh, as discussed in the first video, I have the power charging, which is using this little right angle uh, adapter for the standard USB micro interface. And then I have a USB cable that has been uh, split and is now running into the power section. So I will unplug these two cables and take that battery out. This is uh, an Anker battery. Um, got full charge still, quite a few uh, thousand milliamp hours, etc. Uh, great little battery, and it's just the right form factor to fit inside this tray, and likewise fit inside of the Pelican case. So this battery tray I had to modify. It is based on the Evan Mini design, um, but like I said, I did modify it uh, for the purposes of fitting my battery. Um, I did that in Blender and just used his base model and did a remix of it. So in taking this apart, I'm um, using this Allen wrench, and these are in, but they're not super tight or anything. They're in well enough to hold everything together. Uh, because all the components are uh, 3D printed, they kind of have natural lines for the teeth of these bolts to grip into. Um, but it's not like they are machined metal that hold on real hard. So I do like to unscrew these to make sure I'm not stripping out the plastic. And it might take me a few tries to actually get this battery tray off. Because there are a lot of these bolts and they all fit in different ways. All right, so this battery bracket is now off and you can begin to see uh, the guts of everything truly now at this point. Uh, as you can see, I have a Raspberry Pi 4. As I mentioned in the first video, I do plan on replacing this with a standard Raspberry Pi 3 uh, B+, uh, mostly for power concern reasons. Uh, realistically, I like the Raspberry Pi 4, but it's got such a heavy power draw and not really with a lot of benefit. So we're going to talk a lot about how this is all wired together in the future, uh, but for now I will just note that I do have both a capacitor, which I'm being very careful to not touch right now, as well as a uh, three amp fuse, 
in line uh, just to make sure that uh, both the power draw is equaled out as well as theoretically being able to switch power between battery and external as well as just making sure that uh, any type of power surge doesn't make it to the much more uh, fragile components inside. As you can see on the uh, back side of the I.O. panel here, these are the toggle switches for all of the power. And like I said, we will talk about wiring in the next video. Um, but I do want to talk about the switches themselves for a moment because it is important to understand exactly how these switches function and operate. And amazingly, there's actually not a lot of great resources online for this. So in order to talk through it, I actually have a much larger version of these switches that we can talk through. So the way these switches work, these are lock switches, which means you have to pull the plunger out to switch it. Uh, that does two things. One, it allows you to not accidentally knock the switch and turn something on or off when you're not intending to. Uh, but it also ensures that when the switch happens, it's pretty quick. Um, so it's an instantaneous switch. And this type of switch is called an on, none, on switch. Now, there's a lot of different types out there. But on, none, on has the express purpose of meaning that it is either running power from one source or basically connecting the circuit in one way or the other way, but there is nothing in between. There is no null state. So I'm either going through one circuit or through the other. And this can be a little bit confusing uh, because it is uh, basically the polar opposite of what you might think at the surface level. So the way this works is when it's in an up position, it connects these two pins and these two pins together. So the way you can think about that working is if you have a power in line, the, the positive in here, the positive will be coming out the center. And if you have the negative coming out here, it'll be coming in through here. So the overall circuit would be power in and out to something. Then the negative, the, the grounding comes back out here and then out to complete the circuit totally. And again, when I switch it to a down position, then I'm just connecting it the other way around. So I have uh, now these two connected and these two connected, which means that if I have, say, power here, then the power comes out to the device in the center one, and likewise, the grounding comes back in here and out. So this switch allows for basically two scenarios in and of itself, and I've actually utilized both scenarios in the build. The first scenario is one where you have this toggling between two sources of power. So the way that would work is, if you think about the way I have uh, the external power and the battery power, the external power would come in, say, on the top two pins, and the battery power would come in on the bottom two pins, which means when it's in this down position, maybe it's coming in from the external power, and when it's in an up position, it's coming in from the battery power. So it's toggling between external and battery, external and battery. The other way to use this type of switch is instead of having two power sources that are coming on these uh, you know, top and bottom sets of pins, uh, instead you use it to transfer power or redirect power to two different devices or two different paths. So in that scenario, you have power going into these middle pins, say, you have some external power coming through here, and then you're redirecting to somewhere else. So say maybe the top ones are to a Raspberry Pi, and the bottom ones, as in the case of what I'm doing in my deck build, go nowhere. They are just completely empty. And you can actually see that uh, on this first switch. Uh, this is my power switch. And what I have is on these bottom pins that I'm currently pointing at, uh, those are the external power lines, and the top ones are the battery power lines. So when it's in an on position from the front panel view, it's connecting these bottom two to the middle two, and that is now supplying power from the external source. So that's the scenario, the first scenario I talked about with the switch. The second one is where I'm just redirecting power to specific devices. And as you can see, I have empty... 
uh, pins on all of the next three because these represent uh, in order the Raspberry Pi, the display, and the network switch. And so I have power coming out of the first switch off those center pins into the other ones, and that's allowing me to toggle basically on and off for these devices. And I'm not redirecting power, I'm just cutting the circuit. As you can see in the layout of this overall thing as well, uh, you've got my little network switch, a five port network switch from Netgear right here. Uh, I have all my pass-throughs for USB into the Raspberry Pi. And really the rest of this is fairly standard cabling for how you kind of just install things on a Raspberry Pi. Ribbon cable to the, to the touch screen, um, cables in the I.O. pins going to some of the front panel devices as well as to the screen itself and power and auxiliary jacks. And maybe it's worth talking a little bit about auxiliary jacks for a moment. These are actually fairly inexpensive little devices, but they are very tiny. And the wiring for these things is not always clear. Very similar to the toggle switches, the amount of information online is not always super helpful, but as long as you know how to read a basic uh, kind of device diagram, you can find the information you need for these kind of three pin audio jacks. Basically the way it works though is you have uh, a ground uh, pin and then you have a left and a right pin that connect to the various parts of the jack. So as I mentioned I will talk about wiring in the future however it is probably worth taking a moment to talk about all the components that go into actually doing the wiring. So to do that we're going to set the deck aside for a moment and we're just going to pull out all the component pieces that I have used. All right, so there's all the things you need in order to do a lot of the wiring. Uh, really basic color-coded wires here, nothing real special. Uh, if you can get it, sometimes uh, it is not available, but Adafruit does have this hookup wire spooling system. I really like it, it's a great system. I have the various components with their crimpers, so we'll talk through these for a moment. These are spatula connectors of different types, uh, and I did specifically want to use the spatula connector pieces. Uh, these are very, very useful for kind of uh, quick hot swap, not really hot swap. These are really useful for uh, quick swapping of components or quick rewiring. And instead of actually soldering everything in my CyberDeck, I wanted to have the ability to rewire kind of on the go. Because uh, honestly, again, if you think about it in a uh, end of the world scenario, maybe you don't have access to a soldering station. So these little spatula connectors allow you to have a male and female connector that you set on various wire pieces. And you can see that in the cyber deck in certain areas, such as uh, where I've connected the capacitor in or where I've connected all the power and wiring into the toggle switches. These also have these nice little sleeves. Don't forget to put the sleeves on there. I made that mistake many, many times. Uh, and all of these do require their own little special crimpers, basically. Uh, you can get these as a nice little kit off of Amazon, though, so it's pretty, pretty quick and easy to pick these up, and they're useful for all sorts of electronics projects. Likewise, because we are actually talking about Raspberry Pi and having I.O. ports and all of that, it's also useful to have these kind of uh, pin connector types. And these are good for all types of electronics usage. Uh, the main reason I needed it actually was just for these single pin connectors so that I could connect everything uh, to the I.O. And specifically, um, this was to connect that uh, mil spec connector piece uh, and wire it up um, because I was going to end up having to solder the wires into that mil spec connector um, but uh, the wires themselves I can change and, and make in a different configuration on the uh, GPIO pins for the Raspberry Pi. The last couple things you're going to need are um, basically just things to make sure that everything is neat and clean. Um, obviously, heat shrink tubes are amazingly useful for wiring projects, especially where you're uh, splitting apart existing cables, such as a USB cable or uh, an audio cable, and you want it to be kind of a clean uh, connection point back. You can see where I've used these heat shrink cables throughout and we'll talk a bit more about that in the future when we talk about wiring. Um, but as I said, because there is, of course, a lot of soldering that has to happen, 
Uh, one of my favorite things is actually these little heat shrink solder connectors. Now these were pretty common, uh, I think for a while, being used in kind of marine environments for things like boats and whatnot. Um, but these are great little heat shrink tubes that also include uh, a water seal, a tightening seal on either end, and a ring of solder. And so what's great about this is you basically just put wires in on either side and you use a heat gun to melt the solder and make the tube shrink. And that makes for a really, really quick solder connection uh, between a lot of different things. And so uh, I never need the big ones, but all the smaller ones, these kind of red color ones and these white color ones were used throughout the deck. And you'll be able to see that here where I had to do some solder connections between a couple different wires. And that's very, very useful and, and much easier to do than trying to do a manual solder or using heat shrink tubes to try to hold everything together. So I, I really like these soldering tubes. Uh, they are great and they are well worth the investment. And there you have it. Those are all of the major components that I use to build the Cyberdeck. Obviously, I didn't cover everything in great detail. Uh, I didn't talk about USB cables or uh, fuses or capacitors. And mainly the reason behind that is, is well, those are fairly well understood things. And likewise, I didn't talk about connecting Raspberry Pis to uh, touch screens because those are well documented. What I wanted to cover were the specific details that uh, I made as a decision in building this deck, such as the spatula connector, where I, I didn't want to do as much soldering um, for a couple of reasons, but the main one being I wanted to be able to uh, work on this thing and repair it and do things in the field, which is pretty difficult to do if you need to have a soldering station set up. And likewise, there are things that just aren't well documented, such as the toggle switches. And you can find the information out there, but you have to dig a lot. And so I think it's helpful for me to just kind of express how these things actually function so you can understand it. Because when we start talking about how these things are wired in the next video, um, it's useful to have that information kind of already absorbed and under your belt. Uh, finally, I didn't talk a lot about the 3D printed components themselves. That will be a whole separate video about the models and how I had to modify them and where I sourced the various pieces from. Because this is, uh, uh, honestly, a bit of a Frankenstein machine from a couple different makers as well as modification or custom designs on my own. And I'll talk about, like I said, talk about that a bit more in future videos. But in the next video, I will talk about wiring, how it's all put together, and the circuitry there within. Uh, so with that, we'll close out this video, and I'll see you in the next one.